so I wanted to set the stage for the period that I'm talking about when we think about early Topanga. It's 100, about 110 years ago that these discoveries were made. And it doesn't sound like a long time ago historically, but in Topanga time, there's a lot of periods that that goes through. It's not this time in 1947, before Sunset Mesa is built and all the houses are on the beach. And it's not this time where the motels are sort of being built and there's construction for another bridge of the Pacific Coast Highway. And it's not this time when there was like a pier there and the road was very primitive. And it's not this time before there was a bridge for the PCH. There was a bridge, but you had to go up the canyon a ways, cross, and then come back. So the period of Topanga Beach, when these, in, uh, these discoveries were made, is this time when there was only one house there. And this house was kind of like a hermit cabin used by fishermen who were the only people who lived at the beach at this time until a gold miner, an ambitious kind of a dreamer guy named W.W. Kulbaugh from Chicago arrived and he thought when he looked at this land that the land had been sort of created by the lagoon and the tide and that maybe it had never been surveyed by the government and that if he were to live in this house and kind of cultivate a field behind it that he could claim this land by a homestead act and that he could claim Topanga Beach as his property because previously it had not really been connected to the city. This road is a little bit later, around 1910, but the cabin is much older. The cabin goes back to the 19th century. And it was just sort of being used for people who were there, but it wasn't like owned and the land wasn't owned. It was just, it was a very wild place. And I have some pictures even earlier to show you that too. The, I know the guy that he bought it from was named Harry Johnson, a strange name. <laughs> and I know that that guy came from Indiana in, in uh, I think it's 76, that's when he moved out. But I really don't know much else about him other than that, that he lived at Topanga Beach for about seven years until he sold it to this guy W.W. Coolbaugh, who was 70 years old when he bought it, and he was just this guy that had this like unstoppable energy. He was always going from one dream or project to the next, thinking he was gonna find gold in here or claim the land here, or he also liked to invent things. He invented some garbage cre cremation machine that he submitted to LA City Hall, and when he moved out here, this was like far from the city. This was like, I, I, I'm impressed that he, at that age, you know, wasn't trying to settle down. He was like trying to still discover things and claim things and invent things, find things. And it's while he was here, maybe, that he found these Indi this, this Indian burial mound. And he claims he found it, but there was also a field trip of Stanford geology students that were camping at the same time who also claimed they found it. <laughs> and they claimed it first, but he claimed it louder. <laughs> and he liked giving interviews and telling people lots of stories about it. And then he also had the advantage of living there. So when, this, when the Stanford students went back to college, he, he sort of was in charge of all the artifacts and he sort of like left them out for people to see almost as like an open air museum. And he 
even started to sell them off. He wasn't necessarily respectful of the discovery, but he did like the attention and he did like to sort of profit from it. And I don't want to go too far ahead, but let me see where I am here. 70. Yeah, I want to say that he was also a, a Civil War veteran. And he, he called himself a Colonel Civil War veteran. And um, he also was very interested in railroads and said that he had built the Chicago Elevated Railroad one of the first urban kind of like street car cars and he he came to LA with this story which everybody repeated but I couldn't find any evidence that he did build that <laughs> maybe he did I'm still you know always looking for to learn more about him um, but I wanted to say that Oh, this is another shot of this um, house and it's a couple outbuildings. I don't think that's a date on there that says 14. And he says he found the Indian artifacts when he was out just kind of exploring this area and maybe plowing this land. I'm not exactly sure where he found it. But I think this maybe could be him sitting on the doorstep when I zoomed in on this photo. Or maybe it's that fisherman. One way to, to really tell where everything is when you're looking at the photos is look at those eucalyptus trees. You can always kind of tell where you are. And some of them are still there today. Where those cement benches are at Topanga Beach, That, this this house is this house is basically right where those cement benches are. So this was Topanga Beach in the 19th century. This arch would be where the Mastro's Ocean Club is, and this is why it was such an isolated spot for a long time because it was very hard to build a road into this area. And people often came just to look at this rock, but it was hard to get there. And it wasn't until after this rock fell in 1906 that real roads started to be built there. And that's, uh, until that time it was really just this, it was really just for the fishermen to catch and bring their fish back to the city, but it wasn't really like a residence place and then it started to become more of a residence for him and for and then more of a place for tourists to come and enjoy the beach this is just before it fell as they started to build roads through it and make more inroads to Topanga Beach this is a really awesome painting of of the cabin with the eucalyptus trees from the other side And this is a photo of the same thing. You can see the cabin in the left side. I zoomed this in. This is the full photo. Oh, getting a little far ahead. And this is, um, this looks like it's before he came and plowed the field or I'm sure the house is still there because I'm sh you just can't see it. It's where the eucalyptus trees would be on the left. But it's really fascinating to think that that burial mound is somewhere right down there. And it's just unopened or undiscovered. And it was apparently very large. They said it was like 40 feet by 100 feet long. Where is it in this picture? Well, I don't know exactly where it is. It's just somewhere near his house. Somewhere near his house, somewhere by the creek, between here and the creek. This, is, this shot is 
you might think that's like the entrance to Topanga Canyon, but it's actually um, that hill with the flag on it, that shorter hill. And like this right here would be like where the like real inn would be, and the motel would be like right here. So she's she's looking down on that area. This is the only picture I have of Colonel Kulba <laughs> as he's discovering these things. And one, um, these are some of the artifacts photographed in the LA Times that he discovered. And one weird thing about the discoveries is that the newspapers were all writing about how strange the skeletons were. One strange thing was that they were um, crushed, and then they found arrowheads in the skeletons. But then even stranger than that, they said that the skeletons had these sloped foreheads and like pointy noses and like horns on the side of their heads. And, it, and they said that they were also um, almost dwarfs in stature. And it's really hard to make sense of that and what that means. And especially when you look at these photos, and you don't see that. So I don't know why that is repeated in so many st stories of that discovery, and not only in like eye-catching type headlines, but there were also two professors who studied it, one from Stanford and one from Beloit College, Wisconsin, and they also both said that the skeletons had these, had these abnormalities, so. I don't know. I haven't seen a picture of that, and I don't know why, but I, that's what I read. And I know Coolba was excited to have sold um, a four-inch arrowhead for ten dollars to Beloit College, Wisconsin. I I went. I called them too, and they showed me some artifacts they had, but nothing really significant. A lot of the stuff that he sold to people seems to have been um, shuffled and it may still be out there. I couldn't track down much. And I know that his favorite thing that he found, he called it a royal scepter. And I don't think it's in the picture, but he said it was some kind of like a, a scepter with the head of a, I don't know, like, like an anthropomorphic top that was supposed to be like a some kind of god or idol. He he really liked to imagine what things were. And he called himself an amateur archaeologist even though he was not even any kind of archaeologist. So he he liked to tell stories about what things were. And one of the biggest stories that he told about this finding is that he had heard from older Spanish families that were neighboring this area that they had heard from native tribes that there had been a massacre and that a group of, like an Aztec group came up from Mexico and had attacked the local Indians. And then there had been a big funeral pyre for these Indians, because all of them did look like they had been built, uh, buried at one time. That was part of the mystery of, of the burial mound. And then in his story, in the, in according to this um, Native American legend, in his words, they built this funeral pyre and then the funeral pyre flame was so strong that it went down into the earth and then the earth started to smoke. And he connected that with a phenomenon which is totally real, which existed by the Bel Air Bay Club, which was called the Smoking Mountain. And it was a mountain that smoked um, because 
maybe because it had oil deposits in the ground or something, some, somehow this mountain had actually caught fire in prehistory. No one really knows how, but it did smoke, and all the early explorers to California talk about that until maybe 1920. I'm not sure how long it went, but it was still smoking in his time. And so he drew this connection between what he had found and that phenomenon and a legend he had heard. Um, what else do I want to say? This one comes not from a newspaper, but Chester King told me it was probably from this site. And there weren't, the, most of the um, Native American sites in Topanga were kind of really studied and unearthed in, 19, in the 1940s. And this is listed as early 1900 Topanga. So it probably is from that site. There was stuff found here and there all the time, but it makes sense because there wasn't really like a, a big site discovery in that time period that wasn't cool buzz. Oh, this, I didn't have a picture of the Smoky Mountain. I'm really specific about the things, the area that I'm collecting from and I don't know, that's a little bit outside my area. Although there are pictures of it, I couldn't find one, so I just copied this article. It's sometimes people had thought it was a volcano. I thought this was Kulba in the Civil War because this guy was also a builder of railroads, and he was also interested in gold mining, and he was a con man. <laughs> and he was, he, was, he was always playing both sides of the Civil War and also pretending to work for the Mexican government, and he was, he was always in and out of jail, and I thought, wouldn't that be interesting if that was Kulba at an earlier age, and then he reinvented his identity and came here? And they grew up very close to each other, too. They, uh, Kulba was actually born in Pennsylvania. So I don't know. I got sort of in a dead end there. I don't know what to make about that. I called the Pennsylvania Historical Society to ask them, too. But there's a lot of Kulbas there. <laughs> I think that he's either part of this family, or I think maybe he pretended to be this guy. Because also, when I dug deeper on Civil War websites, W.W. Kulba, the guy from Topanga Beach, was never a colonel in the Civil War. <laughs> he, he was a private in the Civil War. So I don't know. I don't understand the connection between him and this guy, but I think it's really fascinating, especially because this guy had the same kind of like con. Um, yeah. <laughs> He kind of played the same games as Kulba. Um, oh, I'm looking at my notes here. So Kulba pulled out 44 skeletons from this mound, and newspapers were reporting that, like I said, it was a 100-foot-long mound, and newspapers said that when the mound had been fully excavated, it would probably reveal 300 skeletons. It didn't get fully excavated, though. And the Stanford, well, maybe I should go to that slide. So this is, this is the Stanford Geology um, field trip group. And they came and maybe found it first. And they all, there also came a Stanford archaeology uh, class to study it. And I don't know how expert you know, even they might be in that time, but they said that they believed that the site was 1,200 years old. I mean, from the year 1,200, maybe even maybe um, from the year 1,000. And um, the professor of this group, he looks like one of the students, is this guy. 
His name is John Roy Pemberton, but he didn't like his name and he called himself Bill <laughs> or Billy. And he had just graduated from Stanford and he became a professor. And here's another picture of him. He was a pretty amazing guy. He grew up in Los Angeles and he got really interested in science going through the area that is now known as MacArthur Park. It was a forest at that time. And he really liked studying birds. And he really had a struggle to decide if he wanted to be an ornithologist or a geologist. And he decided it was a better career choice to be a geologist. But he never gave up studying birds his whole life. He was writing papers about that, too. And he had a pretty amazing life traveling around the world, and he spoke fluent Spanish, and he lived on Channel Islands with condors, making one of the first movies about the life of a condor. And he, he left um, LA in his teens and went to San Francisco, and then the, the big San Francisco earthquake, I think it was in 1906, happened. And he was there for that too, and he was part of the rescue effort. And he was an excellent athlete. He was a, like, played all the sports. Um, boxing was maybe his best sport. He almost became a professional boxer. And he only taught at Stanford for one, this one summer that these discoveries were made. And then he went to Argentina and did another job. And then he did something else and did something else. And I don't know, I just thought it was really interesting is that he, he was only there for that one moment. And then his whole life was just adventures after adventures. And that he was so young, too. They said all the Stanford students were just wearing sombreros, and they came with cooks from Stanford, and they just all were like all on a big camping trip together. It was like, it sounded really nice. And then the other professor, um, he was in LA because he was studying the La Brea Tar Pits. He was looking for fossils for the museum of his university, which is Beloit College. And when he heard about the Topanga Beach site, he came and checked it out, and he befriended Coolbaugh. And he was one of Coolbaugh's uh, main clients to buy the artifacts. And his wife is an artist named Lillian Mather. She was also an art teacher at the same university. And she was doing sketches all this time, too, of Topanga and Santa Monica. And I have never seen any, but if anybody has, I would really like to see them. I'm sure she sketched that site or somewhere nearby. Okay, I have to tell the end of, this, of the cool boss story, though, which happens before this. Cool boss, cool boss uh, claim on the, the land of Topanga Beach was not recognized, and he wouldn't leave. So one day the sheriff came, and they took all of his belongings out of the house, and they burned his house down. And that was how he had to leave Topanga Beach. And after he left, the like Los Angeles um, government kind of seized that land, and they they had sheriffs living there for several years, and it was no longer it was no longer like a tourist spot or a place. It was, it was like a keep out area. So also the professor, especially the one on the right, was complaining that, that no one could go in and look at the, these um, artifacts anymore because the police were policing everybody away from it. And 
probably were not interested in the artifacts, but there was one of them I read that did find something and sold it to a museum. But there was a period here where it just seemed like the artifacts were all just um, being left alone and then these squirrels started to pull up things from the ground and they started to appear by the um, burrows of these squirrels and they were being pulled up from somewhere else too. It wasn't exactly the same mound, it was nearby, but wherever they were pulling up these um, bones from and also this darker earth that was used to create these mounds, it wasn't um, determined where that came from. And then this is a picture after the house has been burned down. The house would be right there. The house was burned down in 1911. And then I wanted to say too that Kulba fell into like a big depression after the house was burned down, which was really unusual for him because he was such a go-getter and he was like always on to the, like the next, even if it had to be a con, always trying to like create the next opportunity but he just couldn't seem to find another opportunity for himself after that. And he kind of let himself waste away. It wasn't like a, anything was particularly wrong with him, but he started going to the hospital and I don't know what, was, what, what his exact symptoms were, but he ended up dying exactly one year after he got kicked out of Topanga Beach, which I thought was interesting. Almost like he intended to die on that anniversary. And then after the land has been sort of guarded by these sheriffs for like a decade, then the PCH bridge is constructed across the lagoon. And this is, this is where his house would have been. So it's constructed right through here and supposedly paving over this mound or the bulk of these artifacts. And also that other, the other older professor, he was more interested in like following up on the site. He was complaining about that and he was saying that he had gone there but was not allowed to like take anything or really study it, but he said even in this later period when he went there, he saw, in his words, a carload of relics lying on the surface. Also, a little bit before this, um, there's a, 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 an expert on the Native Americans of California of this period named John P. Harrington who did interviews with some of the um, oldest surviving tribal people. And he talked with them about what the name Topanga means, and he talked with them about this area as well. And they told him that they had ancestors there who had been buried under whalebone markers. And that was something that Kulba mentioned too, that in the mounds there were these um, whale bones over the, over the bodies. And they also told him that they thought that this was a Chumash site. The border between the Los Angeles Tongva and the Chumash is always kind of moving north and south. It's somewhere around here and they're not sure, but Harrington thought it was Chumash. And Topanga, I don't think there is a good explanation for what it means, although I hear other explanations. And Tarrington was talking to Tongva people who told him that it was a Chumash word. So I'm not sure if they would be the best definers of that word. Do you think that there's a clear explanation for that word, Chester? Uh, I don't think anybody... I think here too. Uh, Harrington was never convinced that he had a clear explanation. Um, you know, the, there's one definition that's given where the mountains meet the sea, and it's by one of Harrington's consultants, Zalvidea, who had ancestry from Santa Catalina Island. And if you look from Catalina toward the coast, Topanga is where the mountains meet the sea. 
So I think it's just a description. Uh, and Harrington sometimes thought maybe that the root topan would be maybe a two mash word. And I've been working just recently with Harrington Luisenio notes, and he has a translation in Luisenio for Tupanga. And I, I don't quite remember what it means, but it's kind of a locational thing, like something midway up. And so anyway, I, uh, there may be ultimately an explanation, maybe linguists will figure it out. Um, but I don't think right now. And there's also a, another place uh, named something like Topanga down on the coast by Botticitos Lagoon, San Diego area. Uh, that, that there were um, people who were workers for the uh, Dominguez people on the San Pedro land grant who came up with him from, who had worked with him on his cattle down there in that Baraquitos Lagoon area when he was at the San Diego Presidio, and he brought those people up with him. And then there were a lot of people from down there lived in the Pueblo and worked as servants. So um, anyway, there's one person in the mission from Topanga that's from that area down there. Uh, so it, there's maybe more than one Topanga and maybe they have different meanings too, <laughs> so. Yeah, one of the things we learned too, studying the site, I learned is that maybe Topanga Village was the beach, right? Well, you know, I, I always kind of wondered if it was like where Pine Tree Circle is or whether it was at the beach. And there's also historic stuff up in Santa Maria Creek. Um, but uh, I, I think that, well, you know, some of the artifacts that he showed, like the ones from the Santa Monica stuff, those are identical to ones that we found in historic, proto-historic Jumash cemeteries. So uh, I would guess that uh, we're looking at an historic cemetery down there that was being dug up. And the whale bone markers and that sort of thing, they're found in other Jumash cemeteries also. Uh, they may also be found in Tongva cemeteries. I, I'm not, some of the Tongva cemeteries aren't very different from Chumash ones, like out on the islands, uh, on San Clemente and on Santa Catalina Island. Um, so, like, Malibu is not named for the city that was in Malibu Canyon. It's named for the city that was on the beach. Similarly, Malibu, yeah, is, similarly is, Topanga could be named for the city that was on the beach. That's what I think is the case. Of course, in Malibu, the, it's, the, the, the site is real near the, the present city. Uh, it's sort of in the middle of it. So there's not uh, confusion. Yeah. But uh, the, the Malibu land grant was actually called the Topanga, Malibu, uh, Sestoni, Sumo, uh, land grant, uh, maybe even uh, 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 Sakit or you know something like that, which is for Lishishi. And those are the the five Indian villages along the coast from Topanga to uh, um, <laughs> Lishishi is uh, Royal Sakit. Um, so it's essentially the, the the stretch of the Malibu land grant, and it's named after all of the native villages along the coast in the land grant there. So uh, uh, Solstice Canyon is uh, Sestoni or, or Lohostoni in the mission registers. One more thing about Kulba too, even though I said he was a gold miner, that was another strange thing about him. He never found gold either. <laughs> he was always coming back from the mountains saying he found a new gold mine. And then people would get excited, and there was even the moment when the press was talking about there being another California gold rush based on these claims that he was coming back with. But because he never could produce the gold, he always started over going to some other spot and then coming back with new claims of something. I mean, that was kind of like his... He had this kind of like silly life of trying to get attention. And then he did get attention when he found the Indian artifacts. It wasn't exactly how he had planned to get this, this attention, but he loved it. He liked that that's when he really um, started to enjoy building himself up as this like local celebrity, and he like knew exactly what to do once he got it. But until that time, he was like trying to impress people with the inventions, with the gold mines that didn't exist, and he was also telling people about 
everything that was going to be discovered in the Santa Monica Mountains. He has, this, he has this quote here that says, it is my prediction that within the next 10 years, the Santa Monica Mountain Range will resound with the noise of oil derricks and mining machinery of almost every kind. The canyons will be thickly inhabited and the at present primitive roadways will have been improved and almost every nook and corner of that inaccessible country will be opened up. So he, he just had these like wild dreams that he couldn't realize, which is kind of, I don't know, the tragic and also kind of like maybe beautiful part about him. And then he did somehow realize it with, those, with that artifact discovery, if he did in fact make it. <laughs> okay, and then also after he left and before this happened, I learned that there was a silent film that was shot at this site, it's called A Chance Shot. And it was about Native Americans being adulterous kidnappers. <laughs> and also, the film used artifacts, they basically used the mound as a location and they actually used the real artifacts as props and just kind of like messed with everything and disturbed everything and the film is, I think, reported lost. I've, if anybody finds it, that would be pretty amazing to see that. A chance shot. But that's another thing to look for if anybody ever finds that film. I just read about that in the paper. Um, Coolbaugh also had a wife. I should have backed up and said when he came here, but he divorced her shortly after coming to Los Angeles and then lived the last years here as this kind of solitary figure. But I thought it was interesting that they're, they're both buried in um, that graveyard at like Venice and Normandy. And um, they also had a daughter who died. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why they left Chicago and came here in the first place. Chester, do you want to say something about this? Uh, you know, uh, I, I started City College in 1960 and they had an anthropology club. And the first site I worked on was at the Trippet Ranch, the big site up there. And, and the, there was a, like a, on Saturdays, uh, the anthropology club would go and work up there. But this I discovered, uh, well, not long after, walking around from the beach going up, I think I walked up the ridge and came up by Trippet Ranch and then walked down to my grandparents' place. But anyway, and I went back and looked at it several times and then it was going to be developed I guess that was in 62 or 61 that we're just there weeks before it was developed into Sunset Mesa. And do um, you have the other picture from? No, I don't. Okay. There's one I have from over by Castel Omar looking, looking, I guess, basically west. And it shows you that it was all grasslands up there where the houses are now. Um, so anyway, um, so you only, we, you only had weeks to study We only this. had, like, this was the weekend when we did most of the digging, and then people came back and did a, 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 some control excavations the next weekend, I think, and then, it, then there were bulldozers, and they didn't want us around. So um, anyway, it was kind of interesting, because there were volunteers here from different archaeology groups all over in, in Southern California. Um, So anyway, this site uh, where we dug, I think, was the late, la latest occupation up on, on the top of the mesa there. And there, there was shell in the soil that was still preserved. If the sites are much older, the shell usually goes away. And we had a carbon date on one of the shells about 1000 BC. And some of the other artifacts there are, are consistent with that date. And there, there was a, what looks like a yucca roasting oven in the site. Uh, and, and anyway, it's, it, 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 it's similar to other sites around 1000 BC. Um, well, those are some different so what artifacts, we learned about, I guess. What we learned about this site from Chester's research is that it was like an earlier 
an earlier habitation before Topanga Beach was hab yeah. habitated. Yeah, from from looking at other sites like at Malibu and and, and sites in Santa Barbara and and really in general, kind of all over Southern California, after around 1000 BC, uh, and well, just generally in that time, there's a general shift to, to lower elevations by the beach and less defensive locations where you don't need to see people coming so much from all around. Um, and I, I associate that somewhat with societies getting more complicated and, and there's less, uh, uh, you know, kind of family feud things and, and more uh, social structure that keeps that from happening. Um, so, so anyway, this is not unusual to find a site. In the, the earlier occupations up here, the, the site covered a much bigger area, and we didn't dig in areas that didn't have shell on the surface. So we, we didn't dig in the earlier parts, probably, of what's up there. And there's probably occupations up there that are similar to the ones at Tripit Ranch and other sites here in Topanga that go back seven, 8,000 years. So this area in Sunset Mesa had been used for, um, I think, grazing or maybe even farming because it had been plowed a lot already before these archaeologists got up there to study it. So a lot of the material, too, was not in a pristine condition. And then they only had a few weeks. And then it was the Sunset Mesa um, complex was built. So there's a, still a lot of mystery about what was happening up there. But it is really fascinating to know that it's that old and from an, from an, an even earlier tribe. I have a list of some things that were found up there. Um, the yucca roasting oven that he mentioned, uh, sharpened animal bones, a chert knife, projectile point, um, bowl fragments, stones shaped into discs, stones shaped into balls, stones shaped into crescents. It's a, it's a, as he said, not as complex a site, but it's interesting to know that that's, a lot of that material is probably still there. And also at Topanga Beach, a lot of that material, you know, was only really exposed for like 10 years, but really only for like one year while people were able to like look at it and study it. And then it was sort of um, built on top of, especially that mound that they said there were probably 300 skeletons in and they only pulled out 44 and with the artifacts. But through the years, um, th from this time on, there's been varying uh, reports about whether these sites um, have been destroyed or whether they're still, um, whether they still contain enough objects to study. And there have been times when the state parks says they're not going to, you know, acknowledge or protect these sites anymore. And then there have been times when people who live there find still, like in the 70s, arrowheads, grinding stones. Um, and that's what this next picture is. Some things found by neighbors of mine down there. Um, and these discoveries, despite, um, despite much of the site being, the site being destroyed or buried or something, things are always seem to be coming up um, when in 2001 when State Park spot lowered Topanga, um, they did like a survey of the land and they found themselves eight sites in addition to the ones known. And in 2002 and 2003, uh, archaeologists for state parks found artifacts that were buried um, like four to 20 feet underground. Um, I think they were doing like drilling. They weren't like doing a full excavation, but they were just um, drilling holes and then pulling up layers and they were actually finding things still. And they also found things when the houses were bulldozed down there in 2007, but there was so much bulldozing going on that they were not sure where the stuff that they had got 
exactly came for, from. So they weren't sure if they found another site or, or if it was bulldozed from the same site and brought to this dumping area. So they had to create a new site for that too. And um, I think I'm wrapping up on all my facts, but I only know two people's names that came from Topanga, the, the, the original village. They both have Juan in them. They're um, Spanish names of Native Americans. Um, one is Luis Juan Athage of Topabit, and one is Juan Antonio. They were brought to the mission around 1800 and baptized there with those names. And I don't know, is there any other things you want, you want to conclude with, Chester? Well, I'd more rather just take questions, I guess. I think it's just really moving just to know those names and, I don't know, just to think about Kulba and how many times people have thought about him or remembered him, but he was such a presence there at that time. And last year here, I showed a film of documentary footage of the 60s and 70s at Topanga Beach. I have that here on DVD, too, and some other things if you guys want to check it out. And thanks for becoming members of the Historical Society, too. And we have the Topanga Storybook here, which talks about um, this site also. And I also have the articles that I just recently published about it here on the front, too, if you want to take a look at them. And I think that's it. I could mention one other. Oh, the, we could the, take questions too. Yeah. The, uh, th there was also an archaeologist from Berkeley, uh, Nels Nelson, Nels C. Nelson, I guess it was, and he he walked around. I think a good deal of the coast of California. He walked all around the San Francisco Bay. And he walked, I think, most of all of Los Angeles and Orange County coast. And he recorded archaeology sites, mostly, again, I think it was around 1910. Um, so uh, that, there's, there's, I'm sure, records at Berkeley that have to do with his work. That, and, and I know the earliest archaeology site record for the site at Topanga Beach was a record that was filled out by Nels Nelson. So uh, th that's like the Berkeley part of the story, I guess. It's kind of interesting that the Stanford people were working there. And I don't know if any of them had any anthropology ties, but uh, it's sort of interesting because when uh, Berkeley was set up, Phoebe Hurst was kind of the benefactor there and she funded all of the anthropology stuff. And uh, Stanford, when he set up Stanford, he wanted them to equal Berkeley in terms of studies of California Indians. They were both very competitive in terms of pushing for studies of California Indians, which of course uh, hasn't ever been pushed for since. But it's, it was quite amazing that at that time it was the, the big money people pushing the universities to do studies, and I believe that Stanford actually wrote it into the, uh, you know, the bylaws or whatever that set up Stanford University that they would have an excellent California anthropology program, and uh, they never really quite got that. But I mean, they did have one, and they may still have one, but it's never been, you know as big as Berkeley's was. And of course, none of the schools have maintained them very big anyway, um, partly because uh, it's too controversial, I guess. Uh, you know, in terms of like preserving sites and taking land from developers, if you could. Um, <laughs> so. Well, Chester is our um, resident expert, and Eric here knows a lot too, and if anybody would like to ask anything, now would be the time to get some good answers. We also have a um, guest who brought uh, an Indian basket that people can look at. His name is Michael Human, and I'm going to put it up right here, and people can look at that too after the talk. Um, is there anything anybody needs to know? 
the um, city of Los Angeles sent sheriffs and like a city official there to get him out. Oh, I just, I put that quarter there when I took the picture so you could see the size. <laughs> yeah, the, not the mound. That was a mountain that was nearby. Um, they know where the smoke mountain is. It doesn't have a... Uh, a burial mound right next to it, and somehow it went out by itself. Yeah. I have one other question for Chester. Uh, yeah. Is, is uh, the site at, at Pine Tree Circle, is that like Pine Tree Circle, or is it like more like the office, or like the post office, or like, do you know like the kind of area? Well, I don't know the full extent of it, but you know, they, they, they built that library in this site. Um, and then behind it, us, they're building a new house up above the what used to be Verizon oh, yeah. place. I don't know if there's site up there. I've never checked that. <laughs> but but there was where the library is, and then there's all the Pine Tree Circle, and then there's the on on the other side of the road where the post office is, and all along above where the general store is, and then coming along on the other side across from, uh, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it, 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 it's, there's still quite a bit left there, but it's really been badly damaged. They pretty much destroyed it all for the library, because I think they had to have a pay-to-play reason, kind of, to do a lot of digging there. Uh, but uh, anyway, that. It's sort of sad, you know, how, how much of Topanga has been destroyed while I've been living here. But it, it's equal to the rest of the area. Um, and I just might say that, you know, it, it's like uh, th there's really no saving of any history. It's pre-white people because uh, except for like where state parks or parks have bought land, uh, land can't be protected, and even when they buy land, they decide that they need parking lots and and other things on flat areas where sites are. So uh, you know, it's it's there's only one direction <laughs> that that uh, the remains of the past go, and that is that they go away, um, and and it's certainly been sped up a lot. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> any other question? You know, I, I, I went down there and I did videotapes of them bulldozing and they had like an archaeology and a Native American monitor and they had them respectively stand at least 75 feet away from where the bulldozer was scooping up the black dirt and dumping it in the trucks to take it over to East L.A. landfill to get it away from this place. So, I, you know, th th those guys are a little bit superstitious, but uh, they didn't have to take it that far. Uh, but it was very interesting how they did it, you know, uh, with monitors and an archaeologist, but they had to stand back and not really get up there and see what was happening. And they wouldn't let any of us uh, on... Uh, I have a, a pith helmet. I mean, I have a construction helmet and I have a vest, but they wouldn't let me go on the land there because I wasn't hired by the county people. Um, and I, I just thought it was really sad that they had to build a library where they have white people's books, white people's history, and destroy a site. So anyway, I was very upset. Tell me anything, but she 
told me what she couldn't tell me was that there was stuff that they didn't find buried in uh, large concrete tubes hmm. that they put the utility. I was there for the maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I was there for that ceremony actually. Charlie Cook invited me because he kind of wanted, I think, put a thorn in the side of some of the county people. Uh, and I was there, and they had a, like you say, a, a tube that went down in the ground, and they had like a little manhole cover on it, temporary one. And then they put whatever they dug up, and I didn't see what it was, but they put it down in that hole. And then they put the top back on, and then they were going to pave over that. And it's right near where the the bridge to Old Canyon is, uh, sort of in there. there. There's still some intact site right in there where uh, where it goes to County Road from from uh, Caltrans. That stretch they didn't dig it all out and recompact it, so there's a little bit right there between the bridge. But there's the, most of the the shell mid and everything is right over there across from the end of the seventh ray. And you can see it in the bank there. Uh, there's probably a house there, I think, because there were some pestles sitting there once. Um, so anyway, I think that most of that site was mostly used before 1000 AD, like it, mostly what we'd call middle period. And if you want to look at what I've done, on the Santa Monica Mountains, go to academia.edu and, and look at the, oh, something like an overview of Native American, I don't know, something occupation in the Santa Monica Mountains. Anyway, it's by me. And, and, and I have other stuff there also. But that, that is a general overview of archaeology and, and other stuff around here. Um, OK, thank you. Yeah. Well, I agree. They, they, they had to have it dug out like that because they wanted to have the Tepang underground people do it. And I suspect that Tepang underground people gave some money to Yaroslavsky's uh, campaign. And that is what you call pay to play. And, and I suspect that, that, that you know, uh, there are some Tepanga people who were working to facilitate that. And I'm very unhappy about that. So anyway, uh, you know, because I, you know, it used to be Topanga people. No, we'll fight to save things like that. But no, the people in Topanga, the the people in Task, who used to save things, they decided no, we aren't going to deal with Native American stuff because that's too controversial. Because a developer owns that land. And he's a Topanga citizen developer. So, you know, it, anyway, it's just really hard to preserve anything. And even when you live right next to it. Uh, and, and you just have to kind of get used to loss. Because that's the direction of, you know, what happens to history. You know, it was kind of interesting, like the, the, the recent fire, it burned down the 
the museum storage unit at the National Park Service that we had put a lot of stuff in, papers and other stuff, you know, that's history. So when you really think about it, uh, ultimately it, it, it's all susceptible to fires, you know, like the museum in Brazil, the, the National Museum burned to the ground. So nothing is ever saved forever. There's no perpetuity. You know, you can hope for a little bit of it, but it really isn't there. <laughs> Some of my friends who were artists that did stuff there, they apologized. Uh, but, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, I, I don't know what would the memorial say. We destroyed this <laughs> for a better purpose or what? You know, uh, I, I don't really know what it should say. Uh, Anyway, I, I think I've said enough. Okay, Eric has some words to add, and then we're going to do the raffle. Yeah, don't leave before the raffle. Um, three things that came up that were interesting to me. Uh, the reason why Arch Rock, which was one of the main tourist attractions along the beach, why it fell down, is because railroad men blew it up overnight in 1906 because they thought that it was so much loved because it was quite beautiful that it was therefore stopping them from building a train. But actually it was the people that owned the Malibu Ranch that were really stopping the, uh, the train. Uh, the next thing was whenever I hear wild stories, I look for an element of truth in them. In other words, what, what happened to this story that it got wilder and wilder? So the part of this where they said they were attacked by Aztecs, that these people a thousand years ago were Aztecs? Well, I went to um, an annual eclipse in Chaco Canyon up there by Four Corners, and it turns out that uh, there was a, a real civilization going then. People live in the Pueblos, and they were trading all the way down into Mexico with the Maya, and uh, sometime around a thousand years ago, and remember, the Chumash had been here 10,000 years before that. So the, the Tongva are, are latecomers. And so they, for some reason, either it was uh, a climate change or something that bro divided their, their people, because they left, and they all left speaking a Shoshone dialect called Utazteca. And half of them went down to a place in Mexico City and became the Aztecs, and the other half came to L.A. and became Tongva. And it's, it's just, you can regard it as a really weird coincidence that the people of Mexico City and the people of L.A. would both speak Utazteca, or you can just say, yeah, about a thousand years ago, there was something that happened in their culture, and they split up. Half came to L.A., half went to Mexico City. So that Utazteca that they're speaking, as that story gets told, not written down, but told through the generations, that could have been those Aztecs. And the third point was, you know, I grew up around here when I was little. We used to collect arrowheads and stuff. But the, the other myth was about the gold. And all of you that live in Topanga probably have the secret knowledge that, yes, there still is gold here. So let's get some of that gold in the raffle. Sure. Okay, and the raffle winner is Suzanne with two N's. Suzanne with, with Suzanne? It could be this one. Oh, I'd have to read the number. 310729. All right. You're the winner of the Topanga Story book. Okay, I'm going to pull this basket up here and feel free to come over and check everything out. <laughs>